Welcome to the channel, the author of The Sun Eater, a staggering work of genius that stands apart in modern literature. A man who claims that writing isn't some magical art, yet he has conjured worlds on the page that have utterly transported me light years away and thousands of years into the future. We may go on to have a conversation like two normal people, but let that fool you not. I am here with one of the great artistic minds of our age. Ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you Christopher Rocchio, mighty holder of the pen, our orator. Man, uh, Ben, thank you for that. It was very kind. Thanks for having me here. It's uh, it's good to be able to talk to you. I know we've you know chatted on and off for I guess years now, but uh, it's nice to nice to be here. Oh, it is a thrill. Uh, this this feels like the chance of a lifetime to meet you know Da Vinci or Michelangelo, um, and the I Ninja Turtles. To, uh, right? Not the, <laughs> um... to a certain extent, I I I've waited a while to ask you to to come on the channel. Um, but because I, I haven't felt the the need necessarily to to pick your brain about the series, I I love it so much. Uh, the it it feels so real to me and so vivid, and um, I I feel like the the work really does speak for itself. Um, but uh, I I felt like I just I wanted to finally get to ask you some some questions and uh, chat about some things, both about Sun Eater and maybe about other other stories that we've both read and experienced, and pick your brain about those. Yeah, uh, for sure. So yeah. Uh, this is a thrill. I'll I'll start, I think, with a few non-spoiler uh, things, but I just wanted to get out of the way first. I have been uh, preparing for Disquiet Gods, book six, to because that's going to be coming out in a couple weeks. Oh, yeah. And so I have been re-listening to Empire of Silence, book one, uh, actually for the first time kind of doing a reread, and most of the way through there again, and also recently read uh, Dregs of Empire, along with a bunch of the short stories and tales volume three. So those are all really fresh. And just want to say, Dregs of Empire, um, the short story Daughter of Swords, some of the sequences in Empire of Silence, like they've been getting me pretty emotional. Like you've been able to to really, you know, touch me deeply with some poignant moments in, in some of these books recently in a way that, you know, most other stories and, and authors just aren't reaching. So uh, thank you so much for, for just, you know, all that you're doing to, to, transport me and, and to you know help me have all these meaningful experiences oh well gosh no thank you uh i mean that's that's uh, really i mean that's really the point right is is mm -hmm. i want people to i want people to have fun I, I want people to get something out of this and then and, and feel like it they've, they've at least picked a they've at least picked a hobby that that gives them something as opposed to just takes from them um so I, i'm really i'm really glad you've been uh, enjoying the books again uh, I'm glad they hold up on reread too. That's uh, I've said this before, but I, I like very strongly believe, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, that like a, a, any book should be good the third, fourth, fifth time, and if it's not, it wasn't good to begin with. So I, it's it's a relief to hear that at least for at least for you, I've done it. So that's that's good. Oh, for sure, and and I know you listened to Empire of Silence again recently, and <laughs> yes. I, I, I and you've talked about you've been going back and uh, changing you know lines here and there uh, that you thought you could could do better on um and for the new diamond edition which which i can't wait for uh, to see all that art and um but i i'm so curious to see what the changes are because i'm listening and it sounds elegant it sounds uh you know basically just as 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 great to my ears as the the later books do so I, i'm kind of curious what your experience was listening back to empire of silence and uh, what that was like for you do you feel like you have grown in certain ways as an author that you want to make those changes yeah, yeah, I, I think partly it's that, right? Uh, there are also just a number of typos that escaped mm -hmm. me and the copy editor and the editor and the proofreader, and, and so those needed to get fixed. I remember I listened to the audiobook, uh, or started listening to the audiobook when it came out, uh, just to, you know, see what that was like, and uh, the first line of dialogue uh, is missing, there's a, it says, I, it's supposed to say is in, something it says either is or in one of the two words is missing <laughs> and so i stopped the audiobook and didn't listen to it anymore for a long time um because <laughs> i did not want to uh be aware of any more problems that it slipped in because uh things like that seem not to bother other people as much as me because i like it's weird i can hear any paragraph and know like what i meant to say uh and <laughs> uh then hear where i've fallen short of that and so uh yeah last year i listened to book one again all the way through with a notepad and i wrote down you know three four word uh phrases so that i wouldn't know what to control f later and 
uh, give the sentences uh, sort of a polish. Um, I didn't change anything too substantive. Uh, you know, it's not like I really George Lucas anything, but I, I, I went through and uh, with one exception, uh, and, but I went through and, uh, and sort of just kind of quality of life improvement, uh, made quality of life improvements uh, on a lot of a lot of the book, actually. Um, I, I, I hope people will generally agree uh, that that's what I've done. I, I also went through, too, and um, uh, addressed some of the uh, the more homage passages. Uh, my original editor um, really wanted me to lean into that, which uh, at the time I didn't realize was very bad advice. Uh, mm. and so I, I've uh, sort of been trying to walk some of that back because if I get a, a, a consistent strain of criticism, it said the book is too close to other books in certain places. And so uh, I uh, addressed a, a number of those passages. Uh, not all of them, of course, because there's nothing really wrong with, with references and illusion. But uh, the thing about writing is it takes a lot longer to write a book than it does to read one. I'm always uh, yeah. somewhat stunned when somebody's like, I read all of your books. It's been three days. I'm like, whoa, that was like my... <laughs> That's like the last decade of my life, man. Like, slow down, uh, you know. Uh, and so when you're writing, you're like, it's been a while since I like did a Gene Wolfe reference, and actually, uh, my brother in Christ, it was five pages ago. Um, <laughs> like, you need to not, yeah. So I, uh, I, I've addressed some of that in in the revisions, but that was really like th those were really my only mandates was I wanted to uh, address that little bit of criticism, which is really a style thing. It's not like a structured thing. It's not a, you know, a character thing or a plot thing. Um, and I wanted to work on typos and just sort of sentences that bothered me when I heard them. There's um, there's a story, I think it's from an old Aziz Ansari stand-up routine where he uh, he's talking about hanging out with Kanye West and Kanye is uh, listening to his own music. And they're like, Kanye, you listen to your own music? And he's like, yeah, that shit's dope. Uh, I do not <laughs> feel that way. Uh, when people start reading passages of my own work to me while I'm sitting there, I'm like shrinking in my chair. Uh, just, but uh, do, you ever, do you ever have those moments, though, where you were listening to a, a paragraph or a, or a whole sequence. You're like, oh, you know what? I did a, that was that was pretty great. My younger self, like, good job, younger self. Uh, I've had those moments where I've gone back and looked at old college papers that I wrote and be like, wow, I, I really thought of some some great points there that uh, I'm impressed with my younger self. Does that ever happen to you? Sure. When I'm by myself, yeah. it's a lot easier to be like, this is, this is well, to be like, well, that shit's dope. Uh, but, uh, but when, I, when there's an audience, uh, it's a lot more, it's a lot more uncomfortable, I think. Uh, you know, uh, Jordan, Jordan Hill, I wizard does this thing every time he has me on where he uh, uh, recites all of the emperor's titles as if they were my titles. And I just <laughs> am like, oh no, Jordan, why are you doing this to me again? Um, <laughs> why did I give him so many titles? Um, could have been worse. I could have, I could have like gone the full Austro-Hungarian Empire with the titles there. That's like paragraphs. But um, you know, uh, but still, you know, it's a lot. And uh, so uh, it, 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 it's it's hard. I remember, uh, or it's uncomfortable. I remember my dad uh, read the book uh, shortly after I sold it originally, and he asked me a question uh, and said the word Sielsen out loud. And I think it was the first time he'd ever. Uh, asked me a question about the books, really, because my, my dad was very supportive, but he was like, look, you need to make sure you have, like, a real job on the back burner in case this doesn't work <laughs> out, right? Um, and, but, like, as soon as, as soon as it was a thing, he was, I mean, he's been my, my biggest sort of champion ever since, which was really cool. Uh, it really meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but to have him say the word Sielsen out loud was very strange, because I've been, like, thinking about these guys for, like, 10 years, right? And I'm like, who told you? Uh, and there's this sort of a, <laughs> a strange uh it's sort of a strange uncomfortable part of being a writer where like um not only like it's just some of the stuff you write about like weirdly personal in certain ways right so like you know you're like distanced from it but like man that's like a it's like a very private thought i just let thousands of people read um you know or you know uh but there's also just an element of like i may have this like very like esoteric like strange like complete nonsense universe right and people are taking it very seriously and in a lot of ways readers take what we create as writers more seriously than we do and um and that's always a very strange experience um you know um but, so there's an element of that in there as well but that, that's partly what makes it so uncomfortable when people start reading everything in front of you but um but like privately yeah no i i'm very proud of uh, of everything that i've I, i've put together you know different different levels I'm, I'm more proud of the recent stuff because i feel like i've grown as a person mm -hmm. as, as a craftsman but um but like you know writing is uh writing is writing is a cool job because it's like a concrete like measure of your accomplishment when you're done right like there it is right it, it, you know and um 
and being able to go back and look at that and be like, wow, I actually did something. Like, that's cool, right? You know, you, um, yeah, it's cool. And you, you mentioned that writing itself is not some magical art, yeah. uh, but in, in essence, I think there is a bit of, of magic to it that, you know, there are all these, these planets and, and characters that exist for me that uh, you created out of, out of nothing that, that did not exist before. And um, so it, it, it's something I don't, I have very little creative drive myself. I, I play some music, but I just like covering songs I love and I, I don't uh, desire to, you know, create stories that didn't exist before. I just love reading them and, and watching, consuming them. Um, but I think there is a, a bit of mystery and, and magic to it that even, whether it's in the outlining process where you're coming up with the ideas um, and not as much in the drafting, but uh, wherever those ideas come from there, I think there is a little bit of, of mystery and magic to it. Yeah, look, I, I, I know what you mean. And I, I don't mean to like try and suck all the joy out of it when I say things like that. It's just that there is this, there is this culture sort of around writing. And I think a lot of, uh, I think a lot of writers feed into it, I think, because it makes them feel fancy or, or, or special where we talk about like, I remember I was, I won't say which writer this was, but I was at dinner with a bunch of writers and uh, one writer was insisting to me that like writing was harder than manual labor. Uh, and I'm like, that's not true. Like I, <laughs> like it is not harder to dig, uh, to write books than it is to dig ditches. That's crazy. Uh, like I, uh, I have my dream job. It's a tremendous privilege to be able to do this. You know, I've said too, like, uh, this job lets me like stay home with my, my 10 month old daughter and like spend mm -hmm. as much time with her as she needs, which is, uh, uh, an immense, uh, immense joy and an immense privilege. And a lot of uh, parents don't get that. And, and I'm able to do that because of my readers and it's, it's absolutely an honor uh, and a gift to be able to do this. And, um, uh, but at the same time, right. Like it's, um, it, it's still a craft, right. It's still, it's still something you work at. If you're bad at writing, uh, you can get better at it. It's like you can get better at, you know, uh, skiing if you practice. You can get better at making dinner. You can get better at uh, playing the guitar. It's not like, like there's a talent component, sure, but like there's a talent component with everything. That doesn't mean that you can't be like a competent tennis player. You like might not be Roger Federer. In fact, you probably won't be. But like you could at least be better than you are. And the same is true of writing. And there's, you know, there are writers and there are writers. You don't have to be Shakespeare. I certainly am um you know but um you can be you uh and you in fact should be and and i do think that like i think it's story fundamentally is the thing that separates us from uh from the other animals right um and so there's something deeply human about it and i i think that everybody can tell a story you know uh how they'll tell it or how well they'll tell it might be different but i i, I think it's a thing that anybody can practice mm -hmm. um and broadly i think um the place where people fall down on it isn't in their ability to understand story or to come up with ideas um i think it's simply like i, I think the the biggest part where there's a maybe a talent gap is just in the actual craft of writing itself and grammar mm -hmm. and rhetoric because we like don't really teach those things anymore and, and that's certainly something that most people can learn um, some people, you know, like maybe like actually like can't struggle, uh, they can't learn grammar or something. They have some uh, mental Im impediment or, or deficiency. But like, I think most people can uh, be better writers. And, and if that's something you want to do, like you should do that. And you shouldn't like sit around expecting that like Calliope or one of the muses is going to show up and be like, hey, uh, one of the other muses is going to show up and say, hey, it's time, write the story. Like that doesn't happen. Like that, sorry to break it to you, but like the muses aren't real, right? Like um uh, you know you just you just show up like i you know um writing writing's my job right i get up every morning and i like sit down and i write uh, until my daughter wakes up and i have to take a break uh and uh you know you just keep showing up it's you know um mm -hmm. like any but you you also have this i think desire to create that maybe i have not had because i heard you talk about for years uh just thinking about the character of hadrian and the what the sun eater story could be probably you know at way before you ever published oh sure silence or, or uh see so you were just probably uh, you know imagining what this story could be imagining the different settings and characters and in a way that i in in my free time when my mind can wander um i just i don't i don't tend to to dream up uh stories and characters it's, it's just i don't have that that same impetus so that sure. there's no to totally yeah. right like that's that's not everybody but i think there are a lot of people who who do do that, right? Who, mm -hmm. who dream about like whatever stuff they're making up, but then don't do anything about it. Mm, and yeah, for those yeah. people, I'm saying what you're missing is not magic, right? What you're missing is time. What you're missing is 
discipline, what you're missing is a set of tools, right? It's not, um, it's not like a, a mystical quality. It's not like you have the force or you don't. It's, it's, it's it's something that you can work on but if you like don't want to like you, you don't have to right um you know I, I personally i find it a great relief talking to people who like don't want to be writers because there's so many people uh around uh sort of the literary space that like wants to be and that's like a very different conversation and i used to be an editor and so talking to people who want to be writers uh like gives me flashbacks right <laughs> uh you know it's like i don't do that job anymore uh uh, yeah, you know, yeah. But um, which I, you know, I think anybody who you know, like doesn't want to talk about work uh, when they're not working can sort yeah. of can sort of sympathize with. Um, but uh, but uh, but yeah, no, of course, right? Like and and uh, like you know, thank thank heavens for readers, right? <laughs> um, you know, and so. and with you, you know, thinking about this this story for for years and years, um, I, I'm curious because there's so much foreshadowing in Empire of Silence. It, you have the frame narrative and you're just dropping little details in where the first time reader of Empire of Silence will not know what this place means or this person uh, for maybe a long time, many books. Uh, so did that mean that you really setting out to write Empire of Silence or during that came up with the, the whole outline of the, the entire series and had to kind of plan out a lot of those key moments and events or development of Hadrian? Um, yes and no, right? You uh, so this is this is one of those things that like makes you look really, really, really clever, uh, but is actually relatively easy, at least in my experience, to to make happen because uh, where I think a lot of uh, a lot of writers uh, go wrong, this is um, uh, this is actually really H.P. Lovecraft's weakness as a writer, I think, and I I, I love Lovecraft, uh, but uh, but he does not really trust his audience to be as smart as him ever, right? He explains everything in exhaustive and kind of tedious detail um you know if you read like his early work particularly the first two stories you read the cave and the alchemist uh he like literally puts the plot twists in all caps at the end of the story right the monster in the cave is literally a man in all caps right or i am charles le sorcier all caps like uh bro hp like it was real <laughs> obvious like on page three that uh that the that charles le sorcier was immortal and he was still around right now partly that's like stories like this haven't really been like written on mass yet. And so like there's some new conventions. So like maybe it's more surprising in 1925 than it is now. But, uh, you know, but like he, he feels the need to explain a whole, whole lot. And readers, um, readers are smart. And really most of the work uh, when you're reading a book is in your head. You know? It's not in, it's not on the page. Um, you fill in all sorts of details that are not there. Right. If you think about if you're a very visual person. Um, you think about like the details of characters' costumes. Like I probably am not telling you about the stitching and the exact kind of buttons and like you know uh, what kind of cuffs does the jacket have or whatever. Your brain's doing that automatically. And you'll mm -hmm. do that too with things like character motivations and feelings. It's enough to suggest like one little thing to a reader, and then the reader will generate a sort of cl uh, cloud palace in their head of all these other things. And if you say something that's like you're going to talk about in book two or in book four you can give the reader like one sentence and you don't have to really know what that scene means yet like i had some vague notions about uh let's say the end of book four for example uh and what was going to happen then i didn't know exactly when it was going to happen in the series as a whole because when the series started it was five books mm -hmm. right it was four books not seven um uh, you know but i knew it was going to happen at some point and so if you put like a sentence two sentences little details in there um, when you finally get to write it in its more fleshed out form, and then your reader reads that, and then they go back and read book one again, they see the one sentence suggestion of an idea that you didn't have fully formed yet. Mm -hmm. But if you're, I don't want to say vague enough is maybe not the right word, but if you are, um, if you're gentle with the, these indications, you don't box yourself in as a writer very much, right? If you just say, you know, like, oh, like there's going to be a battle here, right? Um, or like this guy is going to be my, my best friend or whatever, um, then when that becomes more specifically true later, that one little detail looks so much bigger to the readers. Really yeah. all you did is write one sentence, right? And one sentence is easy. You can do that, like you do that every time you send a text message, right? Uh, you know, it's just a question of like keeping all of those things in the plan. So when I did the outline, uh, I sort of outline in stages, right? I know the whole story in like super broad, vague detail, right? Like like I could sit down and tell my agent, like, in, you know, in a couple of sentences, okay, like this is a space opera. It's about a guy who like kills a bunch of aliens and he like writes a memoir about it. 
right? Uh, boom, like that's that's the story, right? But it's not the whole story. And so when you like sit down, when I sit down, now book one I didn't help line because I was a, 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 a noob. Uh, but like when you sit down, when I sit down and write each other book, I will, I'll go in with like 10 things that I know I want to have happen in the story. Maybe, maybe it's 12, maybe it's 15, maybe it's three. The even white was really hard because I only had like three or four things I knew I wanted to have happen. And I had to figure out like the first two thirds of the book because they were all like the end of that book. Um, and so I had to come up with a way to like make those points fit together, but I go in with like a couple bullet points and then I kind of figure out what order they go in. And then I look at this like little 10 point list and then I'll turn that into a page, two page, five pages of like the storyfied version of those points. Right. So I'll say, okay, now at the beginning, like, you know, um, I, I always say like, it, like if I was writing star Wars, I'd have a bullet list. that's like that star gets blown up, gets lightsaber from old man, old man dies, right. Uh, meets a uh, smuggler princess uh, gets captured. Right. And like, maybe that's it. And like, what order does that go? When does he get the sword? When does the old man die? When does this, right. And then you go through and then you write like the plot summary. Um, and you explain Luke Skywalker lives on the desert planet of Tatooine and then blah, 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 all the way through the Death Star getting blown out. Um, but, but I'll do like a five page version of that. And then I'll turn that into my proper outline. I'll break down. If I have 10 points, I know, uh, like maybe by like chapter five, I need to be to point two, right. Uh, maybe by chapter 10, because I know at this point how long my chapters are. I can kind of guess how much space mm -hmm. I can allot myself for each one of those, those 10 points or so. Um, and then so I'll turn that into an outline with X number of chapters. And then as I'm writing, maybe that changes. Uh, maybe like one point gets like twice as many chapters to get to as, as mm -hmm. something else. Or maybe I realize as I'm writing the like, oh, like this chapter is redundant and can be d deleted. That's always a nice day. Uh, I just wrote a whole chapter and I did nothing, <laughs> uh, you know, or like uh, the reverse actually tends to happen uh, very often when I'm writing action scenes. Like this chapter uh, is already super long and I'm not done. So it's two chapters now. Right. So there's some flexibility there. I think people, when they hear outlines, think like, oh, like I'm going to be a slave to like my past self and his plan. But like totally change things. And I do all the time, but I'll do that yeah. one book at a time. Um, so I'll have some like those bullet points will exist for later books and I'll keep those in mind. But uh, the really like hard work of getting everything together, I do one book at a time as I go. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's maybe like a long winded answer to that question. But I, but I hope that I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. And then the, the choice for a chronicling tale is interesting. I have not read Book of the New Sun. I know that's a that's been a major influence on you, but um, I'm kind of curious what you feel like you gain from the chronicling tale. I I normally would say I'm so spoiler averse. I don't want to know anything about how anything's going to end. I just want to be in suspense, want things to be as surprising as possible. And you come right out in the, the first page, basically telling us, um, you know, the Cielsen Wars have ended with you know, an exploding star. And now the, the remaining Cielsen live in some kind of prison uh, reserve or something. So like you, you give us the ending of the, the whole main plot arc of, you know, what's happening in the galaxy. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious what you think you gain from that. I, I am surprised myself in feeling like the suspense or the tension has not been robbed from, from the series for me. And I'm not sure why that is, uh, mm -hmm. but I, I have been feeling like when chronicling Hadrian uh, appears on the page that it always feels really interesting to me. And I'm, I'm drawn in uh, to, you know, what he's saying. And the, it feels like he's able to comment on things uh, in really poignant ways. So I, I do feel like it adds a lot to the whole experience for me. But um, from your side, I'm curious about the uh, what you feel like we gain from that frame narrative. Yeah, so, so the sort of first instinct was just that I had this sense that like we have a lot of rules we tell ourselves as, like as like geek culture uh, of like what's acceptable and like what isn't like you know we're we're all over chosen ones apparently uh, where we don't want those anymore uh, I don't believe people when they say that right like actually um, but like I um, we have all these rules right and like one of those rules is like we're like really like afraid of spoilers and things like that we don't like it when uh you know these things happen and i i wanted to break a lot of the rules um like like i said earlier like if i get a consistent thread of criticism it said i'm like too i'm too like samey uh too familiar in a lot of ways but like sun eater is like a is is in a lot of ways a uh, sort of a, a deeply risky and unorthodox story right and this sort of structural mm -hmm. thing is like one of them because i wanted to do stuff that people say you shouldn't do 
uh, because uh, I basically I'm like the world's most disagreeable man, as anybody who's seen me <laughs> review the new Dune movie will will know. Uh, because I did not like it, and I'm like the only person apparently. Um, oh, I I didn't I didn't love it either. Uh, oh, great. Okay, cool. Yeah, we can yeah. be disagreeable together. I got in so much trouble for like not liking it that much. It's like visually awesome. The cast is great. Uh, but like, man, it is not Dune. I'm sorry. It's 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 it, it's just not. Um, but I digress. Um, I wanted to do a lot of things that just people said you can't do, right? Uh, you know, like they'll say, uh, I, I can't say that. It's a spoiler. But um, but like they'll say they'll say things about like story structure or or whatever, and they'll say, I hey, you really like shouldn't do that, man. And I'm like, well, how how could I do that and like make it work, right? Um, you know, and uh, and if I succeed, if people select the books, then haha, I have shown you popular culture. Um, and so that was sort of like part of the impetus. But what I think you get out of it is you get an extra time dimension, right? Like when you when you read stories, they're broadly four dimensional, right? Characters are acting in space, right? You know, uh, and they're moving forward in time. Now, if you have a time travel story, that gets a little more complicated. But the story, even in a time travel story, is still linear, right? Like it's it's you know, you're you're the characters are still progressing along the plot mm -hmm. right and um and that is uh that's that's fine right but if you have a, a narrator who's set outside of the story in some way he's set after it he's set beside it um then he gets to comment on it and the story the whole four-dimensional space is set over here right and if you do that you have this uh, sort of ironic distance where the character can then the narrator uh can then contextualize what's happening in interesting ways and say things about it uh, while it's happening and that textures the story in an interesting way one of the things that has sort of happened to modern readers is that we read to see what will happen mm -hmm. and if you're reading to see what will happen then you can really only read a book once um it you when you reread it you're just rereading it right um you're going on the same path over and over again and if you uh you know like i said i, I like books that you can reread and this is one of the ways that you can do this so reading through the series the second time, and this is something that Gene Wolfe really clarified for me, um, the book should be a completely new experience, ideally, right? Now you can do that more or less well, and I'm not saying I'm, I'm Gene Wolfe, right? Gene Wolfe is, uh, I've said this before, I think he's the best science fiction writer who ever lived. Uh, like in terms of like technical craft and ability, I think he is the best. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, but this is, this is something I really sort of sunk in with me because reading Book of the New Sun the second time it's a completely different book in the same way that like, it's like playing a game on new game plus, right? Like, uh, you know, assuming it's a game that's like really done something about that second quest, right. And like actually made it worth playing. Uh, it's it's a new experience, right? They move the enemies. Wait a minute. Right. Uh, you know, if you play like Ocarina of Time on master quest, like what are the Stalthos doing here? Uh, you know, uh, you, you want, uh, you want people to have sort of a, a, a renewed experience and that distance is one way that you're able to make that reread something special. And that makes the book something special because it makes it something worth going back to. Um, and so much literature is is sort of um, is sort of uh, disposable, right? You just you just read it and you never think about it again. And I don't want to be a writer who writes stuff like that, even if I have readers who'll read it that way. Um, now there are a lot of readers who uh, you know they might they might read the book, right, and never think about it again, and that's fine. Um, but for the people who don't want to do that, I, I want to show up for them. And so that was a consideration from the beginning. Um, but the other thing that you get, right, is if you, and this is especially true if you go read the short stories and novellas and things from other points of view, is that you get Hadrian, right? Um, mm -hmm. And hate, uh, so when you, when you write in first person, the cool thing is that everything on the page is the main character, right? Um, I, I, I say before, people, you know, um, when they maybe complain about like a relationship sort of not making sense or something like that. I'm like, well, like you're only getting one side of it, right? You know, in a sense, there's only one character in the Sun Eater and that's Hadrian. Um, and, uh, and so like, if he's going on a weird digression, describing something for three paragraphs, it's because he's the kind of nerd who would do that, right? And so you, you aren't, uh, you know, so, so really every sentence then begins uh, opportunity to sort of strengthen him. And the Sun Eater, broadly speaking, right, is him giving his testimonial uh, about what happened and why he did it and all of this stuff. And he tells you at the beginning a thing that happened, um, but he does tell you uh, that uh, that, he's, that that's the official story, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like there, So I you set up an expectation that you then sort of, maybe don't take a hatchet to, but you might take a scalpel to a little bit. There are going to be 
I have been, I think, surprises. I always laugh when I see Goodreads reviews that are like, oh, it told us the ending on page one. This book's dumb. I'm not going to read it. It's stupid. <laughs> so you're like, man, if you think that you like know all two million words from reading the first five pages, actually, you're dumb. Uh, like, like that's what I have to say to to say to those reviewers. Like, come on, man. Like, there's a there's a lot more book actually. Uh um you know and and then and then even with the oops even with the chronicling tale and howling dark uh something happens towards the end that i think shocks everyone uh just was so surprising uh in based that happened that based on this, i wasn't gonna say yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> based on this kind of based on this kind of frame narrative and uh you know first person retrospective uh just something you thought was impossible uh you know c comes onto the page and just blows you away be like, all right, there's no rules here. This is this can still surprise us. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm with you. I've been, I, I was, I was maybe skeptical at the beginning, uh, since about like, oh, I guess I'm not gonna, you know, be able to be so surprised along the way here, and I'll just, I'll just go on the journey and be happy. But um, no, you, you've, you've been able to make me treasure the journey and also be surprised uh, all along the way, which, which I think just, just speaks to your, your creativity and uh, just the. The way you're willing to to really go out on a limb and try new and interesting things in in your narratives and stories. So uh, kudos yeah. to you. I think you have succeeded. Right. And and uh, speaking about the other point of views, man, uh, the Lesser Devil is so interesting because when I read Empire of Silence at first, you're just with Hadrian only in his first person POV, and I really wrote Crispin off as this just oafish brute. Uh, he he says a few really kind of annoying, unthoughtful things. And Hadrian's just constantly insulting him. And I just completely wrote him off and, and thought of him the way Hadrian did. I am, when I'm reading you know, the novels, I am so immersed in Hadrian's POV. I am living his experience. I'm seeing through his eyes, hearing his thoughts. Like I am dissociating for myself and and be, becoming Hadrian. And so I, I was perceiving Crispin in this way. And uh, then read The Lesser Devil, and he became such a more nuanced, three-dimensional human that, you know, Hadrian did not fully understand in his youth growing up, you know, with, with his younger brother. And then going back and rereading Empire of Silence, you're talking about, you're hoping that it's a new experience. And it was. Uh, seeing Crispin on the page every time, like, oh, Hadrian, like, you you don't understand everything about, about Crispin, about your, your younger brother. Uh, probably about anyone else, <laughs> as, as we all are always grasping to understand everyone else around us and just yeah, making, we all, making we all the best fail, guesses. Right? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But but you succeeded, I think, in uh, giving me such a new experience just in the beginning of Empire of Silence through recontextualizing Crispin, uh, being able to experience his POV, and then knowing, you know, that he has all of these complex, you know, things going on in his mind and, and uh, facing a lot of the same conflicts and, and inner challenges that Hadrian's going through with with growing up in that family and that father and it was it was so different coming back to that in Empire of Silence so um yes on, on that front you, it was a major success I think yeah and no, this is something I think about a lot just because uh I, I'm like a very anxious person actually right and so I I, I think every time I have you know a, a rather trying exchange with somebody I, I'll come away you know, really, really rattled or something. But then you like learn something later. It's like, oh, right. Like that person's not a jerk. They're having a bad day or, you know, uh, there's a thing you didn't know. And actually you were wrong, right? You did something, Christopher, that was insensitive in some way. And, and like, we never really can like a hundred percent to get in another person's head. Right. And so the, the storytelling format here, like absolves me of the need to try um, in a lot of ways. I can just give you you know, Hadrian's perspectives on people. I, I've said this before. I, I started, I plan on writing a Valka novella. That'll be the next one, uh, almost certainly. The uh, next thing I'll do after book seven is to go back and, and do the story that gets skipped between books three and four, because uh, it really needs to be her story. It can't be for Hadrian's point of view, mm -hmm. uh, logistically. Oh, but I tried to write it originally, and I had two problems. One was that I had, like, insufficiently world-built that part of the galaxy, and I, like, just didn't know what I was doing, and I wanted to write now so i like got started before i did enough work uh and then the second problem was that i'd like not really thought about their relationship like from her perspective which uh some people i think maybe that sounds bad to them but um you know i i don't often know that like we ever really understand how other people feel about us accurate like i don't know like 
I sometimes wonder why my friends like me at all. I'm like so grouchy. <laughs> uh, and yet here they are. Uh, you know, but um, but I don't like like I couldn't if you asked me to like get in my best friend's head and explain like how he feels about me with 100 percent accuracy, I couldn't do it. Right. And nobody could. Right. And so, um, you know, uh, this is just something with those with the other point of views I wanted to sort of mess with. It's also something that like you see in historical narratives, like more broadly. Right. You look at uh, primary source accounts, especially right of, of various events like things do not uh, they do not always gel. And it's not because like the people are lying or whatever. Maybe they're like emphasizing different details about an event um, or they have like um, they have like maybe some time order stuff uh, wrong, you know, but, you know, uh, in, in reading history, you come to realize that like our actual records are like themselves seen through this like matrix of confusion and and uh, and, and mistake and obfuscation, deliberate obfuscation sometimes, right? And you have to sort of triangulate in, in, in doing any historical study, you try to have to I, I triangulate what the truth is, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and since Sun Eater is like a document, these books are a, a document that exists in the universe. Hadrian actually wrote them for people to read eventually. Uh, you, you know, um, that's sort of an element I wanted to I wanted to kind of play with, um, you know, because I, I love writing these short stories that are counterfactual in some way, either because <laughs> uh, they're saying something that's true that um, that Hadrian skips or doesn't say or they're saying something that's completely nonsensical. Uh, I just wrote a story uh, that's going to go in. We're doing a special edition of The Murdered Son, which was uh, the original draft version of Empire of Silence. And the story in it is completely ridiculous. Uh, like, Hadrian kills Sirianni in it. Uh, and, like, way earlier in the story, uh, way past where we are now. Uh, and, like, the Hadrian in it is, like, a very different person. Uh, uh, he, he is, he's, like, a lot more, like, Achilles. Um, and... Um, it, it was just like fun to to mess with this stuff because like I know readers are gonna read it and be like Christopher why did you waste my time with this um, and I'll be like because uh, I thought it was funny and I thought it was interesting that's why um, <laughs> and I, I hope you do too uh, but I'm very excited about that story because it's just so it's so goofy like uh, the writer doesn't know that the Cielsen don't have sexes the way that humans do so they're just Cielsen men and women in the story and like that's not right man uh, they don't have those. Um, you know, so it, it's it's fun to sort of mess with that because mm -hmm. real history is like that. So. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and uh, I I really appreciate all of your mentions of uh, you know ancient ancient figures on Earth or um, because you know we we still talk about Achilles thousands of years after he may or may not have existed. Um, you know, somewhere in the Mediterranean, and it's not uh, at all out of the realm of possibility that. You know, thousands of years into the future, people are still talking about ancient figures and mixing them up, like Sid Arthur. I love. Yeah. Um, I I have very like I have very strange feelings about the Sid Arthur thing because it's it's like become a major part of the world building, and it wasn't supposed to be initially. It was just a dumb joke, uh, and now I'm stuck with it. <laughs> um, but I but I also think it's really it's there's like there's a lot of really interesting narrative resonance there between like the Arthur story and the Buddha one, and, and sort of like playing with stuff like that's really, really fun for me. There's, um, I did the same thing with like Schrodinger's cat and the Pandora box, Pandora's box story. Right. And like having the opportunity to do silly things like that is, um, is really, is just really a delight. It's a really fun part of the, really fun part of the storytelling. Oh yeah. Uh, just to ask on, on a bit of a different topic here, cause you've recently been blowing up in this corner of booktube uh, for a while. It was just, you know, Mike got you on people's radar. I, I came to you because of I was watching Mike's book reviews, and uh, then a lot of the smaller booktubers like me were were uh, just trying to get the word out about Sun Eater. But it wasn't until recently when it was like Matt's fantasy book reviews. I was really pushing him. Maybe I maybe I had some small impact on that. Uh, he came out and loved it, and then Patrick, and then Daniel Green all around the same time. And uh, I'm I'm curious if if that has uh, changed anything for you or or what the effect of that has been um it was fascinating watching daniel green come out i think after empire of sons or howling dark review i can't remember but he's like oh i'm excited for a hadrian corruption arc like it looks like this might be going in in this direction and i'm like wow that's uh definitely not how i ever read the character or the series and um 
curious, as, as it's been blowing up a little bit and you've been seeing more reactions, uh, do you ever become a little bit like Frank Herbert, who uh, was so protective over, you know, what he deemed was, you know, his themes or the, the real essence of Paul? So I, I saw Frank Herbert uh, might have uh, written the Dune sequels in response to people thinking Paul was a hero. And so he was kind of engaging with the audience reception of his of Dune and then getting upset about them misreading things and then responding to that uh, in future works. But I'm, I am curious, just uh, has, has Sun Eater's rising prominence, um, you know, affected you in any way or, or changed things? Uh, not as far as the writing goes. Um, I, uh, so I, I, I'm like pretty stubborn. And, uh, uh, if I find that like people have figured something out, uh, you know, or, uh, I found that someone else has done a thing I was planning on doing, uh, already, like in a, in another story somewhere, I'll just do it anyway. Uh, because like I've done all the, the groundwork of setting up for this thing. And if I decide then that like, oh, they figured it out. I gotta, I gotta surprise them. Uh, then, um, then like I, I I've like built all the setup for nothing and it's gonna like feel weird, right? Um, and it's gonna maybe be disappointing. Now, um, so I, I usually will I'll just stay the course um, because the reality is is that um, like it's surprising to some people, but there are a, uh, or it's not surprising to some people, but there are like a lot of people who don't figure that thing out, right? I'm sure that when the Game of Thrones show spelled out who Jon Snow's parents really were, that like uh, maybe even most of the people who were watching <laughs> had no clue right yeah. uh even though like the book fans had like used their you know infinite monkeys typewriter powers to figure out that this was the correct answer in like 1997 right uh but like, most people didn't know that it was still a surprise there were a couple people i saw who figured out a relatively big plot twist in, in disquiet gods um like like a year year and a half ago and i was like oh good for them right like they will feel very smart when the book comes out uh, and they did because you know the book's in like early access because Bane is special, right? So some people who have, um, have already seen that they were correct and they were like, "Oh, I totally called it." I'm like, "Yes, yes, you're very smart. Good for you." Uh, turned into the uh, the grandfather from Princess Bride, um, and uh, you know, so like that's all fine. But as far as like you know secondary effects, yeah, it's been it's been great. Uh, uh, obviously, I'm selling more books, uh, which does not does not suck. Um, hmm. You know, especially now with the with a kid, it's uh, it's it's useful to have the money coming in. Yeah. Uh, and there's been uh, there's been some commensurate sort of job security things going on uh, with that uh, related to like publishers, like an interest and in, and things like that. Um, you know, so like that's all been good. I, I've had a much stronger sort of bargaining position um, for you know asking for things, uh, which has been which has been really nice. Uh, probably have some more on that uh, in the next uh, next couple months, uh, so that'll be exciting. Uh, cool. And um, you know, people are a lot more willing to listen to me than, than they have been historically, which is nice. Because uh, like, I wasn't like I, I told them this wasn't going to happen. I was like, look, like I'm, I'm getting a lot of attention over here. Like the sales will get better, uh, and I was right. So that's cool. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, so like, you know, publishers are more receptive, which is cool. Um, but um, uh, I also like kind of had to pull back from the uh, social media stuff a little bit. I was yeah. in a bunch yeah. of Discord servers, and you know, it was getting to the point where people were tagging me to ask. Uh, I don't want to say uh, let's say random questions about the books, and it's like you guys know that like I'm writing, right? Like, do you like <laughs> want your question answered, or do you want uh, book seven? And the answer is always they want the question answered, and that's like actually that's ooh, wrong answer. Uh, sorry, I love you guys, but uh, like I especially now I only have like a good three, four hours a day where I get to write because you know, I'm, I'm taking care of my daughter. And um, and so that's when I'm at my computer. And if that time is like, I don't even, I can't even answer emails like I used to. Um, uh, I have more of them for starters, but I have less time to answer them, which is which is hard uh, because I, I, I'm being a little bit flippant, but like I, I, I like talking to my readers. I like uh, doing all that stuff. It's it, it, it's really fun. And it's, it's a sadness to not be able to do as much of it as I was. Um, but like, I in a certain sense, I, I knew that it would get to uh, get to this point eventually where I like couldn't do everything that I was doing, mm -hmm. sort of change gears. And, and so it's nice in a certain sense to be there sooner than I thought I would be. Uh, so, yeah. you know, to, uh, to Daniel, to Patrick, to Matt, to, uh, to everybody, to Mike, especially, uh, this is Mike who's sort of patient zero here. I, I owe a lot, uh, you know, uh, to sort of riff on, on, on Dio talking about Richie Blackmore. They got me here faster than I would have on my own. Um, so, um, 
you know, a huge, huge thank you to, to all of them and to yourself, of course. You know, you play a part in that too. Oh, so. thanks. A very, a very little, very tiny part. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy, I'm so happy when to see uh, the kind of word getting out. Because I've always felt like this sci fantasy series could have a massive audience. And a mess, it, the, the readership who would love it, I think, is, is huge because it, you know, I think it is overlapping circles between, you know, the, the sci fi side, the Dune, like Dune has a huge readership, a uh, huge fandom. And so, you know, definitely a, the, the Dune kind of audience, the, the fantasy audience, modern fantasy, like Patrick Rothfuss has a huge audience, uh, Chronicling Tale, you know, so I feel like your audience for the series could be humongous that we just needed to get the book in people's hands um, and the, the audiobook narrator, Samuel Rackin's amazing. And we just need to get people listening. Um, and yeah, I, I knew it would take off. It just uh, kind of just reached some sort of, you know, critical velocity, uh, escape velocity. And now it seems like it has. Um, yeah. It's on, it, it's on its way. Certainly. Uh, things have been, I mean, it's not uh, empire of silence has not dropped off the top 10,000 on Amazon since January uh, when it came back into print uh and uh that's never been true before um and that sounds like a low number but um that's it's actually pretty high when you consider that's all books on amazon right so uh the advantage of a big series is when you hook a reader you you might be selling not one book but um you know five six seven eight nine like including the the stories and novellas um so it, it seems like a series is great if you can find that that readership for it, even if it's not uh, humongous, uh, that you know, just just being able to to pull people in, and then uh, you know, you can you can go off and do other things after Sunday or probably, and then just still be pulling people in to getting your your backlist out there and uh, just providing that that steady income and security. Uh, I imagine is is going to be possible uh, just with the steady stream of word of mouth that I I I don't think will ever end at this point. I, I hope I hope you're right, and and I also like uh, don't plan on really stopping the supply either, right? Mm -hmm. Once I'm uh, once I'm done with uh, book seven, I'm not going to leave the universe. Uh, I'm, I haven't quite decided if the next book will be an unrelated thing or it'll be a Sun Eater standalone. But I plan on sort of going back and forth for the next few years, doing standalone novels, Sun Eater, and then not Sun Eater, Sun Eater, not Sun Eater, or vice versa. Yeah, I mean it's working for Sanderson because you know he has this whole big Cosmere things, and then. Um, people who are new to it might be intimidated, like, oh, do they have to start a big series like Mistborn or or Way of Kings with Stormlight Archive? But, you know, his secret projects, he's now releasing a bunch of standalones, and he's telling people, you can jump in with a standalone, and I think that might be um, just easier for some people to to be able to access than the start of, like, your seven-book epic giant Not necessarily, series. yeah, jump yeah, in. Yeah. I, I, have a, I have personally have a, a deep aversion to really long series. I've never read Wheel of Time. Uh, I've never read, I, I tried to read Malazan, but I, I I didn't really like Gardens to Moon very much. Um, but I, I didn't for a long time because I looked at 10 giant books and I was, yeah, or yeah, 17 yeah. giant books. And I'm like, look, man, like, whew, it's like trying to watch like all of Doctor Who. Like, uh, like that's a lot. Uh, yeah, us, like us mega series it. people. Like, yeah, like we're we're a special breed. Like we, we see that and that's appealing. Like I see that and be like, ooh, I could be immersed in this one story and in, in setting for months like that I, you know that is so appealing to me but um yeah for a lot of people i think the idea of uh, this ginormous huge series with a bunch of chunky books is is a lot but uh so i i feel like some of your standalones that could you could read without having read the series would be a great thing um to expand the the readership for sure yeah, this is a conversation I had with my friend uh, DJ Butler uh, years ago. Was that uh, what was his sort of sense was because his his first series, uh, or at least his first traditionally published series, didn't really didn't really catch off. The first book's Witchy Eye, which I, I think is great. If you're looking for a fantasy recommendation, uh, I will recommend Witchy Eye until I die. Like it's awesome, uh, but uh, it, it hadn't really found an audience. So he started sort of experimentally writing like new things. Like he's just like I'm gonna write a standalone book. Uh, and we'll see if like that's the thing that catches off, right? And he'll, he did that several times, kept making book ones to things. And he's like, because like what I I have the sense that I need to like create as many doors into my work as possible. And uh, I you know was uh, was blessed that my my, my first uh, my first series has done has done very well. Now it took a little while to get there. Um, you know the first three books came out pre uh, pre plague, 
uh, and they did okay. Um, book three came out right in uh, July of 2020, so it, it frankly kind of was dead on arrival, and like things were looking pretty bad because then I had like took two years to get book four out because uh, my wife was not particularly well, and I had to sort of take care of her. And um, uh, then uh, fortunately, 2022 things started to really get better. Book two had sort of Mike had Mike had worked his magic, and uh, book two was uh, book four did pretty well coming out the gate and book five too was like right after it later that same year and so uh and since then like things have really 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 blown up uh you know so things are things are different but i i feel like i'm to the point now where i need to go back and think about these these uh doors into uh mm-hmm. and i think a door into sun eater that's not empire of silence is good but i also think that's reassuring to people who are like are you done like are we never going to see this piece yeah, yeah, yeah. again and i'm like no um uh, I, I'm pretty sure I know what the next Sun Eater book is. Um, I, I think I could say that. Uh, pretty sure. Uh, I've got a few options, but like there's one I'm I'm interested in at the moment, and I'm getting I'm not close to the end of book seven. I'm I'm about a third of the way through it, but uh, it's close enough that like I might still be thinking that this is the best idea by the time I finish. Because I've always said whenever I'm done, I'll I'll make a decision about what's next, and um, I'm not going to think about it too hard now. But like I think about it a little bit because I don't want to like lose too much time. I take a couple weeks off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I like I like writing. Uh, you know, I uh, uh, I think I get clowned by my readers sometimes. They're like, what are you reading? And I'm like, oh, I want to read. Uh, not really anything right now. I want to read some new stuff. Like I want to read Jonathan Strange and Mister Norrell. Like you know, that's like 15 years old, right? And I'm like, oh, uh, I, <laughs> uh, but like I'm I'm like I, I just don't read very much anymore. At least in the genre yeah. because I I'm always writing and I would like rather use those neurons to write than yeah yeah stories at this point um which is uh which is like fine i i Mm -hmm. writing is writing is more fun than reading for me um at this point which is maybe a good problem for me to have but um but yeah so i I, i'll Mm -hmm. i'll I'll jump into something pretty pretty shortly after this and whether that's more sun eater or like a completely new thing you know we'll see uh but i i've got both sort of ready to go and it's great that you have the you have the leverage now because you have a fan base and a readership and that will follow you to new releases. But when you're a debut author right out of college signing with, you know, a, a publisher, a trad publisher, uh, you have an, an editor like at that moment, you probably have the lowest amount of leverage any author could possibly have. And and you, you mentioned already that they gave you some bad advice about um, maybe some homage to other other works. But I, I'm curious, like, was were you uh, just, you know, basically very open to the publishing suggestions, or do you feel like you you had to take them at that point? Um, well, it, it it depended, right? Like, like, look, like any conversation with an editor is like really a negotiation, and this is like one of the things they don't tell you when you're a new writer uh, or like you want to be a writer. Um, there is, I think, one of the reasons people like are are more interested these days in like going indie is there's this perception that, oops, I'm like I'm saying uh is, is that like you aren't uh going to be able to make your own choices like they're going to tell you what to do and you have to do it and, like that's not true right um you know there's always a conversation to be had there and like when you're new like maybe you don't know like how much of a conversation that can be right and partly that's maybe down to the character of the editor uh my understanding is that like if you were a young uh, isaac asimov and you were working with john w campbell you like better do what john w campbell said man actually like he was pretty didactic um, there are no aliens in foundation uh, because he said no aliens, uh, and, uh, and like, that's just the way it is. Um, but like, that's pretty uncommon these days. You don't run into editors that are like nearly as didactic as Campbell was. Um, and like, you know, for all of his foibles, like Campbell was a great editor, right? Like uh, there's probably, probably no single person has had a greater impact on the field, at least in science fiction, uh, than him, but that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother stream. Um, but, um, in any case, uh yeah no like like there were some things that my editor said uh that i should do that i was like oh hell no but then you um you you keep that in your head you don't say that part out loud you say ah like i'll think about it like maybe uh maybe we'll do that and then you like don't do that but you like then do some of the other things that you were thinking about or like well i'm not sure about that but like maybe uh maybe they're right um and then like my editor also gave me some really great advice like um for example uh, you know, uh, anybody who gets a murdered son later this year will be able to see when Adrian leaves home in Empire of Silence the first time, he just leaves. Uh, his mother does not help him. Um, his mother helping him was my editor's suggestion. That was a really great suggestion. So I don't want to, um, I don't want to seem like I'm being like too 
too like hard on that editor when I say like maybe uh maybe copy name of the wind more is like not the best advice ever like it's not it's not great advice but man uh what if his mom helped him leave home like that's really that was really good I think a really good choice um I really I really feel good about that, uh, that did, did they did they offer the the copy name of the wind advice that just purely is like writing to a certain popular market at that time yeah. or perceived perceived popular market so it wasn't about improving your vision of for the book it was just purely like a kind of market readership thing yeah so like one of the big secrets about publishing right is they actually have like and it's not really a secret anymore because like the chairman of penguin like came yeah. out this they don't year. know what's gonna work <laughs> they, don't, they, they don't they don't they don't know anything right uh, so they don't know like when something works they don't know why um and like this is very obvious if you look at like young adult stuff right because something will hit and they have no conception of why it was magical and they will just copy it chasing that high and that like broadly works because people like, I mean, like, you know, like I had this conversation with Kevin Anderson once he's like, look, it's never been a better time to be a reader, right? Uh, for the same reason, there's never been a better time to be a heavy metal fan, because if you only want to listen to uh, like, uh, what did he say? I think it was Scandinavian Gothic chick metal. <laughs> you have an infinite supply of that. You can listen to nothing but that until you die. Uh, and there's, there's never been a better time for fans of that specific thing. That's true of, of literature too. He's completely right. Um, there's some downsides to that. Cause like, I don't know that we as readers have as much in common anymore because in like the eighties, like you had to read, everybody's reading the same thing. There was just a lot less made. Right. So there was like a more centralized culture. And, like that was cool. Yeah. People would have a conversation that everybody knew everything. Like I have a, a friend, a guy I used to work with at Bain who like had a, photographic memory basically of like every issue of analog ever printed right because he read all of them he knew all of them he could talk fluently about the entire publication of history of analog up until like the 70s right and like that's awesome like we don't have that anymore we don't have like a like outside of a few like core series right lord of the rings wheel of time and that was whatever right um you know we don't have a like really a canon of fantasy or science fiction literature anymore except the older stuff um now there's like a lot of very popular writers now but like there's so many that like you could just pretend grimdark didn't exist if you like don't like it um, you don't have to engage with that as an element of of the culture right you could just like totally skip it. um and like uh in a way that maybe you, you you couldn't escape necessarily the fact that like i don't know it's the 80s and and like i don't know michael moorcock exists or something right like like you you know it's there because it's like you know, it's a smaller field, smaller pun. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, things have, things have changed. Uh, I, uh, I, I was going somewhere and I'm afraid that I rambled about this too were, much. Well, were there any sequences in Empire of Silence that oh, are oh, there oh. because of that? Be, the, like the, the name of the wind or, or whatever writing to market advice, like did that end up like their whole sequences or, uh, oh yeah. In, in uh, are... uh, Hadrian, uh, being homeless was not in the book originally. Um, and specifically, that oh, was wow. my editor's suggestion. Wow. Um, okay. Uh, well, I, can I thank the editor? Because that's both times I've read the book, uh, just such a poignant section. And okay. I, I, I am so thankful that that's there. I, I feel every time so touched, uh, getting to know Kat and, you know, her, her story and, uh, that, yeah, I, I do, I can see though that it's, a bit of a, a cliche like storytelling trope and and it came up again in the a book i read recently the first binding by r, r. verdi there's a whole section there which does a kind of similar street rat kind of thing yeah. um and and so i could see that it yeah it, it might be similar to a lot of other things that, have, that are around or that have come before but uh, i am very thankful that it exists in in empire of silence well, you know, I, I wanted to do the best I could with the suggestion, and I, and I didn't think it was a you know bad idea at the time. It's just it's one of the things maybe, uh, and I'm not saying I would like obviously I didn't remove it in the Diamond Edition or anything mm -hmm. like that, but uh, it, uh, it, it you know if I had that conversation today, I'd be like, man, I don't know, like maybe like let's not you know take a whole thing from you know someone else's. Uh, from someone else's uh page you know there and and, and and sort of do the same like maybe we should do something different that like kind of accomplishes mm. the same thing yeah um, yeah yeah you know maybe just maybe go straight to the gladiator stuff uh, a little bit faster do more of that um i i kind of regret that like I, I should just write a gladiator book i think that'd be fun uh <laughs> but uh more than yeah but um but yeah so like that was that was maybe um 
you know, something that uh, that I would do differently now. Um, you know, By the I way, think... the gladiator stuff in a, I I did not know that that was going to be a big part of the the books. Gladiator, the movie is one of my favorite of all time. I grew up. Um, I can't remember exactly how old I was when I saw it in the theater, but it left a real huge mark on me. And then I, it, you know, would rewatch it later, and um, it was it was such a heroic, gritty tale and um had this grand epic sweep to it and i i the but even just the action sequences you know in the arenas uh were so you know heart heart pounding uh, i feel like that's just some of my my favorite uh types of action scenes and to see them come up again in, in sun eater were such a joy uh and and even even the second time around um man it that's that's a lot of fun was gladiator a, a touchstone kind of movie for you too so, so uh, I, I'll tell everybody a secret. I have never actually watched Gladiator all the way through. Um, <laughs> oh, I, uh, which is weird. Like I'm, a, I'm, I'm not not a Ridley Scott fan, but like I wasn't quite old enough when it came out to watch it. My parents like didn't let me. Uh, it wasn't really like ever a conversation that happened. Uh, we just like didn't watch it. Um, and like I've seen clips, but I've never, I've never watched Gladiator all the way through. Um, I watched a ton of Roman movies, but like I've never actually went back and watched Gladiator all the way. Uh, which is weird because, like, I, I, like, love, you know, I love Blade Runner. I love, um, you know, uh, The Duelists, which is, like, I think his most underrated movie of all time. Uh, I love uh, Alien, you know. Um, King, there's a little King of Heaven in there, too, uh, in the books, for sure. But, like, Gladiator is, like, weirdly, like, a, like a weird hole. Uh, but, uh, obviously, you know, you're doing Roman stuff, and so uh, you got to do Gladiators, right? So, uh, yeah, no, yeah. Um, Bread, bread and circuses, and it fits. It fits though with the, the, the mentality of of the Solon Empire and and how they you know maintain their power and uh, the interests of the 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 nobles and um, it it fits really well and I I think yeah just cr creates a really interesting contrast between the Solon Empire too and other other places that uh, don't do these sorts of these violent games and. Um, no, I, I think it works perfectly. I, I love it, uh, and and so yeah, whatever 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 inspired choice led you to want to include that in there, I am very very thankful. Um, yeah, okay, I don't and, remember and, specifically. Yeah. I just I just like like gladiator fights. Like I think, yeah, I yeah. they're fun. To, they're fun to write. Like I, I don't know that I would go see one, but like I think they're fun to write about. You know. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a very sort of dramatic setting and stuff like. That. And then like look, like I'm 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 a big uh, I am a big Roman history guy. Uh, and so you, know, you kind of can't, kind of can't escape the the games, right? They're they're sort of everywhere. Um, yeah. And so you know we had to had to do had to do the gladiator fights. Um, and Hadrian yeah. hates them so much. Like, of course yeah. he's yeah. Them. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, bro. Yeah. Oh, oh man. Uh, coming back to Empire of Silence, where you know you know that he's going to be involved in them later, and then watching him scoff at them so much from the box early on uh, when he's just a spectator. Um, that's it's one of the, the great joys of, of rereading the series. Like you, just knowing what's to come, uh, you can you can see all of these these resonances earlier on, um, and yeah, I I just have been loving this reread. And uh, I was I was not planning to do a full reread. I think I'm going to plan to do the full series reread uh, leading up to the the last book. But I like to dip in uh, to get back in the feel of the the language and the the setting and the, the terminology and, and the character um, before heading into book six. And it's been it's been so fun. I'm, I'm going to be going from Empire of Silence Hadrian to Disquiet Gods Hadrian. Um, many hundreds of years. Like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that'll be yeah. that'll be some whiplash for me. Um, but but I I really feel like the the character feels like organic. Both you know younger Hadrian and the seeing him grow through the through the years. Um, it feels like you know the the seeds of who Hadrian becomes are really present early on um, and. Things that he also changes from uh, are, are cool to be able to reflect on, and um, so yeah, just just unbelievable character work around around Hadrian. I think it's it's he's just such a real kind of person for me in my life that I that I think about on a regular basis and um, respect and and uh, just just hold so highly. Uh, you know, he's able to inspire the the people around him uh, through you know loyalty b because of his own. You know, good heartedness and uh, sacrificial nature, and and um, the respect he has for everyone else, and even non-humans. Um, so he's a real, you know, inc incredible 
character to I think you know look towards for for some uh, virtues and and some some moral guidance as well. And uh, you know between him Tor Gibson, uh, there's some just some incredible kind of life lessons I think that that you're teaching throughout these books. So no, yeah, well, thanks. I that 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 really means a lot to me because uh, every now and then I'll, I'll run into one of the readers who like I love the books but like Hadrian sucks. I'm like man, that was like not what I wanted to have happen. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's not man. Whew. Uh, cause I, I, you know, I, I've been writing, you know, I've written millions of words as him now. So like, I take kind of personally, um, but, um, I, I'm also one of those guys, like I was, you know, as a star Wars fan, like I was a Luke Skywalker kid. I wasn't like one of the Han Solo guys. Yeah, um, me too. Me too. Yeah. You know, like I, people are always like, oh, the main character is never the best one. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, but like, that was another one of those things. I'm like, I'm going to try really hard to make you eat that sentence. Uh, you know, um. You know, maybe for some readers I don't, but like you can never have 100% accuracy um, as a storyteller, right? In terms of results, mm -hmm. and so if some people don't feel that way. That's fine, but I, I I'm always heartened when people come away feeling the way, precisely the way that I would like hope they did. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not yeah. like Frank Herbert though, where I feel the need to like go on NBC and argue with everybody. Uh, but uh, but it's it is nice yeah. when people read the book that I think I wrote instead of a different mm -hmm. book. So, and uh. Can we, can we chat about Frank Herbert a bit? Because I just read uh, Dune Messiah. I saw part two of the movie. And uh, is this a case where, you know, me thinks the author doth protest too much? Like Paul in Dune is extremely noble and heroic. Yep. And, and, and I, so Herbert then is shocked when the readers say, you know, Paul is a hero. Like, like he didn't put, a, a genocide in the first book of dune you didn't put it in the second one either look i obviously i owe a lot to frank herbert i like i grew up i read dune for the first time i think in seventh grade which is like maybe a little early uh and i like was obsessed with it right because i uh, that would have been like right around the time uh that revenge of the sith came out i remember leaving the theater uh after watching revenge of the sith uh like very bittersweet right like uh because i was the right yeah. age i really love the prequels i was young enough mm -hmm. to think that like pod racing yeah was me, awesome. me too me too and, like, yeah totally yeah and, like, i played the like, pod racing video game yeah. dude it's so good uh i still have it <laughs> yeah. i have it on n64 yeah. right over yeah. there yeah. uh yeah. but uh but it's so good right uh and, but i went away and i'm like man star wars is over like it's done like wow like a, a like an era has really ended and i like kind of wish that it had stayed that way but that's a whole nother a whole nother yeah. thing yeah. um <laughs> But um, but I, I was like, what am I going to do now? And my friend, uh, who actually is the guy Gibson is named after, the great head of me all the way through school, uh, was like, have you read Dune? Uh, and it later turned out he had not read it yet. He had watched the David Lynch movie because he was like a weird kid and he like already had seen Twin Peaks and he was like real into it. Uh, he was like, I watched, it's like Star Wars, but weird. And so I, um, I'd forgotten about it, but my mom was watching the David Lynch movie, like late night TV randomly once. I'm like, what is this? So I went to uh, the library and got the CDs, checked them out. And I, I ripped the MP3s, the audio book <laughs> off yeah. the CDs, uh, returned the CDs, kept the uh, MP3s. Whoops. Mm -hmm. um, and this was like the George Bridell recording. And, uh, and I listened to that and it was like, oh, this is like, this is like the next thing, right? Uh, for me. And I like, was all in, I was all in on Dune. Um, I went through all the Herbert books. I read most of the Brian and Kevin books. Like I was that, I was that into it. Um, and, um, and I had the same, I had the same feeling. And um, I, you know, uh, so I didn't like Messiah at all. The first time I read it, I was like, what is this? Right? Like uh, this, this does not make any sense to me. And as I, as I've gotten older, right. You, you like run into Dune fans and Dune fans are very, very strident about this point like you know paul is like the bad guy right and like one you're putting that way too strongly even for what happened and two like did you yes, read yeah. the other sequels because uh the golden path right the whole point of of frank's dune books right is that between paul and later the second the god emperor they are working to negotiate humanity through uh you know all these multiple futures in many of which humanity is wiped out completely they're trying to save humanity from extinction but they are also trying to free humanity from tyranny for all time right now paul bulks uh in at the end of Doom messiah right like he's unwilling to commit to the golden path because it requires him 
to do some some things that even he's not willing to do. He forces his son to step into this place, which is like, man, not not cool, Paul. But um, but the God Emperor then carries his forward. He becomes this tyrant who like rules for four thousand years and um and and really like he gives humanity a genetic memory basically of oppression so they will never ever suffer it again and then he finds a way to free humanity from prescient tyrants like himself so they find like creates a gene that like frees people from uh being able to be seen by people who could see the future right so humanity is finally like really deeply free uh and then it gets weird like books five and six man i i, I can't even in good conscience advise people read those <laughs> just the, like the ending doesn't exist really frank's ending doesn't exist and like they're just so strange that like mm. it's it's hard it's really hard sells uh, I love the first four books, but the first book is not the book that Frank says he wrote. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't think so either. Yeah, it's, like, it's just the, not there. He's just, it, he just didn't it's do set it. Up, um, it's set up where uh, Paul is this this very honorable, you know, younger kid who the son of a very honorable noble father who gets dishonorably slain, and then the Harkonnens are a very just purely evil kind of force that like. Getting revenge on them seems um, kind of right, uh, and and then Paul becomes part of this uh, foreign culture, and he's extremely respectful and embeds himself there, and and learns their customs and their language and their ways, and um, he's he's in a uniquely kind of he's in a unique position where he can help them kind of overthrow their oppressors, and then and then does, and every everything about it is a hero's journey. It's a it's. You know, and I, he's completely not cynical about it either, right? Like he he he's like, look, like these people, uh, like can provide me the means to get revenge for my father, but like I can help them too, right? Um, you know, and 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 it's it is a completely like mutually symbiotic relationship in the first book. Now, like Frank does, like Children of Dune in particular, I think it's sort of overlooked out of that first quartet, um, because everybody talks about Messiah because it's where Frank's thesis is, but actually Frank's thesis is in God Emperor Dune. And God Emperor Dune is the real masterpiece. Like it is a fascinating book, um, but Children gets overlooked because in Children he sort of explores the consequences of Paul on Fremen culture, right? But even there, it's really hard for the reader to see what's happened as a bad thing because, um, I, I know you said you just read Messiah, so I'll be like mm -hmm. kind of kind of broad about this. But like Arrakis is starting to get a little bit more temperate in Children of Dune. There's like rain clouds and stuff, mm -hmm. and like the Fremen are some of the like the older, like more conservative Fremen are complaining that like the old ways are getting lost uh, yeah. because uh, the um, the environment's getting softer and like they've had all these like more opportunities. But like the fact that you don't live in so miserable a desert that you need to recycle your own pee, like it's very hard for a reader to see that as a bad thing. And yeah. so the fact that Paul destroys traditional Fremen culture by uh, you know, re, uh, realigning the empire and centering it uh, on Arrakis, like, is very hard for readers to feel like is a bad thing. And it's made worse by the fact that Frank skips the jihad completely. So we don't see um, the terrible things that are really done in Paul's name. We're told, like, oh, we're going to make war drums out of my enemy's skins. Like, okay, like, maybe we should see them do that, right? Maybe we should see the Fremen, like, uh, you know, butchering villages uh, and being horrible, right, to people. Maybe we should see... Um, Paul, uh, like, worshipped by these, like, horrible space barbarians and, like, all this terrible stuff happening. Maybe we need to see the concentration camps, ma'am. If he's literally space Hitler, maybe you need to put that on the page instead of just telling yeah. us. Because all I saw, like you said, was a decent guy doing his best in difficult circumstances, all right, who was also, by the way, manipulated by this horrible coven of evil witches mm -hmm. who are the real government, right, that he basically overthrows. Because um, this is the other thing. Like, sure, he, he like, deposes Shaddam, and supplants him and takes over the imperial system but like the thing about dune right it, you know i was talking to somebody who's like well you know like you know this is horrible like sort of patriarchal empire like that's not the universe man the universe is run by these uh by these witches uh actually and they kind of use the great houses like pokemon um in yep. order to accomplish their aims and paul does beat them and like they are gross right they like you know first chapter Guys, Helen is like, some people aren't really people because they're like not good enough or whatever. And Paul's like, that's messed up. And Paul happens to be uh, not just people, but super people by their definition. And he's the guy saying that, right? And so Frank does not communicate his thesis in that first book at all. And I think you can see yeah. people rebel against that because most Dune readers um, are super casual. They read Dune and they're like, that was pretty cool, I guess. And they read Messiah, if they read Messiah at all, which most of them don't. 
the Reba sign and the like, what the hell, actually? Like, this is not the this is not the book you sold me. And Frank says that's because uh, his readers are dumb. And a lot of, like, Dune's readers will police this. They'll say, actually, like, you didn't read the book properly, man. Like, I've seen so many articles since the Villeneuve movies came out that are like, the movie improved the book in certain ways by changing things. And, like, maybe the movies clarified what Frank the thesis that Frank thought he was communicating with, but it does not clarify uh, what's actually on the page. Right. Um, And I don't even think it does that successfully. I've thought about this a lot since I got uh, in so much trouble for not liking the movie on my stream with Mike, but, (laughs) um, but like if they really wanted to, to hammer home the sadness of, uh, and the horror of Paul's cynically manipulating the Fremen, which again, is not what he does in the books. uh, If you really read the text, uh you know uh then they shouldn't have made chani leave they should have had chani be another person who uh is swayed by the by the myth that paul is becoming and and have her uh be another person that's a casualty of paul's choices right have her not be his equal his partner right but become his his subordinate they do not make that choice in the movie i think because they're afraid to show uh they're afraid to show chani like that but like if that was the point they wanted to drive home they should have actually tripled down on the book's ending harder, um, and they didn't do it. Um, so I don't even think they communicated what they were trying to communicate when they altered the book properly. Uh, I think they made weird choices. Um, that being said, of course, the movie is beautifully shot, right? Like, all the tech is so cool. I have the art book, and I've been, like, looking at that thing, like, basically every day. It's so cool. Like, all the little design elements, so great, right? I just wish the script were better. Um, yeah. But like, yeah, no, the, the books don't communicate this at all. Um, and it's also necessary that Paul and Leto act like this. This is the thing, too, is that like Frank can say all day, right, and, and for years that like, man, like really this is a cautionary tale about the dangers of charismatic leaders. But like you wrote a series in which the two most like autocratic people in history are necessary to save humankind from extinction. That's the books you wrote, Frank Herbert. Like I, I read them. Like, that's the point. Now, like, both Paul and Leto in the books feel bad about what they're doing, but they, like, and they feel trapped by their own superhuman vision. Uh, But they both, like, know that they're doing the right thing for humanity in the cosmic sense, right? Yeah. Um, So so Herbert essentially wrote books that didn't align with his kind of vision. It's weird. It's it's, it's weird. Yeah. A, a, A lot of writers are like this. They're not very conscious or deliberate. They don't, like, actually uh they they just sort of write things and then they say what they think separate to it i think it's like like they like we have different neural circuits there's like the writer the writer personality and then there's like the the normal person right Hmm. Uh, i don't think a lot of writers um i I, I shouldn't say a lot but it seems to me that a number of writers are pretty subconscious or unconscious writers and i think that frank herbert was not super conscious when he was writing of what he was writing this is like a super hot take i'm gonna get in a lot of trouble for this i think craig herbert is a genius but i don't think he's a genius for the reasons that he thought he was uh, i love those books i think they're great um but when he talks about them he's talking about books that don't exist um yeah you know i i, I just look I, I i love Dune. this is one of the reasons why i think gene wolf is better i think gene wolf is uh, clearly a very conscious, very intentional writer. I don't think you could write Book of the New Sun without being extremely awake mm. all of the time. Like, I don't know how much caffeine, uh, <laughs> you know, or tobacco is required uh, in order to, like, function on the level of... Requ- like, it's like, you know, like, take the melange the whole time uh, in order to write Book of the New Sun. It's, it's like, it's so, like, in- it's, it's like reading, like, a, like, a, like, a, like a German watch. Like, it's just so meticulously crafted. Wow. I know. Um, I, I have them on the shelf. I'm gonna give them a go at some point. Yeah, it's just a very different sort of kind of writing. Like, look, like I, I really like. I hate to be like. I, like, I try not to criticize other writers, like really at all, right? But like, it's easier when they're no longer alive, you know. Um, yeah. Just because, like, you, like you, you don't want to be like a like a jerk. But I have like such a deep relationship with Dune. It's a book mm-hmm. that's meant so much to me. Um, it's really the book that like made me want to write science fiction and not fantasy, right? Like, it's. It was hugely, hugely impactful for me. This is like obviously true. There's a lot of Dune in Sunnier. Um, and there's a lot of Dune in Sunnier because like I just don't agree with Frank Herbert. Um, I keep thinking I should like make a video that's like, you know, it's got the cover up there and it's got the clickbait title that says anti-Dune question uh, mark. You know, I think I need to explain like like why it's like this because people are like, what is this Dune fan fiction? And like, no, this is like a very 
like strenuous Dune critique, actually. Like I really like I really felt the need to sit down and say, Frank, I, I hear you, man, but like I wanna um you know, I, I, I wanna I wanna ask you a couple questions and rather than ask you a couple questions, uh like, you know, let me just do my own thing here and sort of hope that yeah. people will get yeah. the message. Because there are a couple it's, of comments I got on that mic stream. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh no, go for it, go for it. I was a couple people who um who were saying like, well, like why don't you just make your own movie actually if you think you like no Doom Better? Like, <laughs> bro, I wrote my own book series. Like what like I've done more about yeah, it. Yeah. Like, I'm not like a person in the comment section just belly aching because like I didn't think the movie was as good as David Lynch's yeah, or something. Yeah. Like I actually like I've thought about this probably more than anybody alive. I've probably yeah. thought about uh about my issues with Frank Herbert more, more than anybody else. Yeah. Uh, again, an author who I, I respect immensely. Um, but, um, but like a, a writer who I think um, is of two minds about everything um, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just want to maybe discuss that in relation to Sun Eater, but I think I want to go into Sun Eater spoilers territory at this point. Yeah. So for sure. um, I wonder if I should maybe put a banner up. Um, but if you have not read the Sun Eater books, maybe this is the right time to dip out. Just want to be able to talk freely. Oh, up through until, Ashes of Man. Yes, through Ashes of Man and maybe Dregs of Empire as well. Um, okay. But I have not read Disquiet Gods yet. Okay, so no so Disquiet Gods. Me, you, heard, you heard the man. Let me see if this will actually work. There we go. Okay, it's there. Oh, should I make it scroll? Let's see. Oh, that doesn't even work. Oh, well, we'll just keep it there. So is part of your response to Dune um, making sure we know that the Sielsen wars are necessary, that the Sielsen are not going to live peacefully side by side, that they are going to try to um, just destroy as many human worlds as possible and take the humans for food? Like, is is that part of your response to Dune, making sure that this threat is is very clearly one that we have to try to, you know, for charismatic leaders to try to gather the human force together to ally and fight against? Yeah, yeah. And and we specifically have to, like, take, we have to take the question seriously, right? So there's sort of, like, the first arc of, of the series is about putting that question squarely on the table, right? Hadrian is someone who, like, really wants to do something about this, like, the nice way. Right. Um, he thinks that all the, you know, all of the adults, all the, all the lords of the empire, like his father, who is like maybe the problem. Right. And, you know, um, so we need to take that question seriously and, and sort of uh, address it. And like, man, can we do anything about this problem? Um, you know, peaceably, uh, can we negotiate? And now this is part of the reason like to do aliens too, right. Is, is like, I want to, I, I want to take off the table, the, the question of allegory. Right. I, I want to draw a sort of maximal philosophical proof here and say, like, I'm not talking about like some other human culture. This is not like the Spaniards and the Aztecs. This is not, you know, the Jews and the Assyrians. Right. This is this is humanity and aliens. It's not about other people. All right. Um, cool thing about science fiction is it doesn't have to be, actually. Yeah. Uh, I like Tolkien, like not a big fan of allegory. Um, like I, I think if you find something in the story that applies to your life, symbolically metaphorically actually that's great but like this is not secretly like a political manifesto about like what i think about x y or z that's really silly i, I there are some people who were trying to figure out uh how it must be that sort of thing on the internet and uh, some people sent me a couple links and i was like what are they doing like it's a story about aliens um and it's about humanity facing aliens now we haven't done that yet but like maybe those are questions we sh should ask uh, in case there are aliens, like maybe we should have a ethic as a species for like how we deal with um, actual irreconcilable differences. Um, because with humans, like you can always reconcile somebody at minimum, at maximum could convert, right? You like, you don't have to act like yeah. that anymore. You're a human. Yeah. You can act like me now. You don't have to die right now. That's obviously that's under some duress, right? But like mm -hmm. that, that solution is always there. Now, what if neurologically they can't do that right now? That's an interesting question and so like that was an element here um because like look sun eater is very melodramatic and people are like man i'm really glad that like he uh lampshades that all the time uh because otherwise i couldn't handle it and like 
naturally, I don't think I would have done that. I think I did that because I felt like modern readers would be like, I can't handle how like black and white, like how maximalized all of this is like very extreme. Right. Um, but like, I like painting with, with bold colors. Right. I, I think that, I think that that is, um, I think it's interesting. I think it's visually appealing in sort of an aesthetic sense. Right. Um, and um, and so like we needed to do that, and, and in order to like really push the the logical proof here, the philosophical proof, out as far as possible, it kind of needs to be very extreme, right? So we need aliens in the first place because that's an extreme. Also, they're cool, right? Like aliens are, yeah, they're, they're just cool, right? Um, you know, like we should do that, and it's also a thing, you know, just be that guy who points it out that like Dune didn't do actually. So if it's a copy of Dune, why are there aliens? Um, you know, uh, so I wanted to do something different there. Um, but yeah, um, in short, that was sort of, yeah. that was sort of the thought yeah. process. Like that's one of those was, things that come off the table. And being in Hadrian's point of view at the start, uh, you don't know much about what the Salesen are like. Uh, you know, he's very sensitive toward non-humans like the Umand, uh, Animesh, and, um, you know, he, he's interested in, in, he's one of the only humans that can speak Sielsen and he's interested in trying to speak with them and, uh, you know, hear, hear from them directly and, and get to know them and, not treat them just like a an alien other to to fight against, and you think like oh maybe if there might be a bridge that they could build, and then you know the whole plot of Howling Dark uh, spoilers for Howling Dark is leading towards this meeting where you know he's he wants to use his his Yelson hostage to return and and make some kind of treaty, and it looks like possibly you know they're coming to some understanding, although uh, the Yelson are saying some some really nasty things and don't understand uh, some human concepts uh, around, you know, how, how to interact with, with other, with others. Um, and it seems like they might be building that bridge. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, Bassander Lynn and, and forces come and, and kill that meeting before it can, anything can happen there. And so and, un, until you start hearing from the Sielsen and how they speak and their, their concepts for things, and then see like, Oh, this, this initial, general that that hadrian was meeting was, was an outlier uh, maybe looking for an ally against the the more powerful sales factions um and then once we get to know them and siriani uh it's like wow there there's no question uh the humans there's no bridge to be built here um, right so the, yeah. it was it was just really fascinating being in hadrian's point of view because you kind of you start in that more idealistic place with hadrian and you kind of as you gain more knowledge as you become less ignorant as you interact with them more um start to figure out really what's going on and what's what becomes necessary and you lose the the kind of idealistic naivete involved in, in maybe you know what this could be without violence uh, and then come to this more pragmatic understanding of, of what needs to be done um I, I just loved how that played out through those first few books um yeah and it's important too in doing that that like you can't be too you know i was talking about like extreme colors right like people uh you know, people talk about how like, oh, black and white morality, lame, right? Gray morality, that's the real stuff, right? <laughs> uh, I don't subscribe to that, right? Because I, I think you can you, you can reach gray if you have layers of black and white that are like really laminated, right? Um, and, and so like, it is important not to be like too straightforward, right? So like, it's not the Cielsen who ruined those peace talks, right? It is us. Um, although like maybe they were doomed for this from the start, right? And you can't just come in and say like, like, like modern readers will not tolerate these are the good guys these are the bad guys done they're like i my brain too big for that man uh what do you think i am three um and so you, you can't do that um so you have to like sort of make sure these things are complicated and it's also like more true to life too to mm -hmm. make these things complicated so I, I i think um in a lot of ways that like frank herbert's personal conception of who paul atreides is is sort of like is sort of like hadrian's like sort of spiritual father in a way, right? But I think that John Carter is like his grandfather, right? Because Paul is really an anti-John Carter, right? They're both characters who come to a place from outside who then take over the native culture and 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 rule only in John Carter's case, it's a good thing uh, and he like becomes a god. And in Paul's case, it's a bad thing that he becomes a god, right? And, and now Hadrian does not become a god, uh, but, um, you know, uh, some people think he does. And, um, but like, I, I sort of acknowledge, I have to acknowledge, right? Um, like Frank Herbert's critique of, of, of leadership is like not wrong, but it's also an inescapable facet of human nature that like those people will emerge, right? And like our solution can't be wait for one of them to become a 5,000 year old worm man 
uh, and do some science to save us from whatever, right? Like that's not, that's not gonna happen, right? We need a different answer to the question of like, what do we do with heroes? Uh, and the answer is like, like ride the tiger, man. Like, uh, you know, not the quote, holy diver, but like, you know, like it, it's kind of like, you might actually be stuck along for the ride. There might actually not be like, if Alexander the Great shows up, like you are probably following him. Good luck. Uh, you know, but then, but then it's also realistic that a lot of people want to tear them down. Uh, yes. And, yeah. and to see it's so painful later in the series to see Hadrian having done so many heroic things for humans and the Solon empire to then try to be torn down and undermined and, and then not credited. Uh, it's, it's so painful to, to be reading alongside Hadrian there and be like, wow, no one else outside of, you know, his, his close friends uh, really know kind of all of the heroic things he's done and the bravery, the courage, uh, maybe even the, the emperor kind of knows, but uh, doesn't really uh, care enough to, you know, if he's if he's slapped, I guess that's the that's as much insolence as he can as he can brook. Um, but there, it's painful that the the humans then are are not making use of one of their most valuable tools in this war. It's wartime. There's an emergency, and uh, Hadrian spoilers uh, through tells three. Uh, so just a uh, warning there. Um, going off and living on Jad. For, for hundreds of years. Um, and, you know, he's he's basically out of the fight over there. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's so, it, it does ring true that, um, you know, humans, our society also wants to, we will follow, uh, but we will also try to tear down those um, who are, you know, in the spotlight and uh, the, the leaders. And um, so I, I, I just want to compliment you there. It, it does ring very true uh, seeing Hadrian, you know, become that, inspiring leader uh and the hero but then being torn down as well is a very yeah. very painful we, we do that though right uh we do this all the time to to to, to war heroes and to uh you know people who make uh who make big uh, big sacrifices big changes uh for good or ill right like like these people are often like very multifaceted complicated right but to, to like choose a like choose an obvious one like look what we put oppenheimer through uh right? yeah yeah yeah, yeah. very much oh. in the very much in the zeitgeist, yes, really, yes. right? Yeah. Um, you know, now I'm not like a big fan of dropping nukes on people, right? But like, you know, like they did ask him to do that, right? Yeah, uh, you yeah, know? yeah. He uh, he was working working tirelessly for the American military and their war effort, and then they they put him through, you know, the endless interrogations and um, oh, what yeah, what an interesting analogy there. Uh, yeah, that's and very we, true. And then we, I mean, like, look, like Scipio Africanus, I think, ended up exiled, right? After he, like, was the guy who beat Hannibal, right? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, for his uh, his hard work, uh, put trying to put the empire back together, Aurelian was assassinated. Uh, you know, Belisarius, uh, depending on, like, what version of the story you believe, like, died blind and a, and a beggar, right? Uh, you know, for reconquering Rome. Like, we... We do this. We do this all the time as a species. We, I mean, uh, like I'm, I'm a Catholic, and you know, from my perspective, we like killed God, actually, right? Uh, good job, us. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, you know, and it, it, it's it's in human nature to to make exactly this mistake. We do this. Uh, we do this all the time. Um, and so, like, you have to. That has to be in the story. Otherwise, it it maybe be too cheesy. Yeah. Um, can, we, can we go into Dregs of Empire? Uh, oh, sorry, hey, yeah. someone has not read Dregs of Empire, but um, we had never been in Lorien's POV before, and so that was just fascinating, because I had really constructed this image from Hadrian's perspective of who Lorien was and what kind of incredibly loyal, noble, honorable thoughts they would always be having uh, on the sidelines as the, the heroic sidekick. Um, and then just so fascinating to hear, you know, Lorien had been in love with Valka and had been kind of unrequited this suppressing that uh, maybe building some subconscious resentment toward Hadrian for, for many, many years about that. Um, and then I was, I was pretty shocked in Dregs of Empire when Lorien hears some, some rude gossip about Hadrian from a, a known enemy, Lorcan, Lorcan Breathneck. Uh, so why he would give credence to anything Lorcan Breathneck is saying. Uh, and he hears that, that Hadrian is, has, stopped grieving and is living it up on Jad with uh, a harem of, of women 
and he's he's out of the fight and then you know and Lorian uh kind of can't can't help himself from from kind of like believing this and uh really resenting Hadrian and and now that he took the fall for Hadrian and he's for for a while I was like man I don't why would Lur Lurian believe this um and sure yeah like but then then giving it more thought spending more time on it uh you know, yeah, I I built up this picture of him as the ultimate loyal soldier, who would never have any any bad thoughts towards Hadrian. But then uh, that gets all complicated in a really interesting way. I thought he was he was really beaten down. Is 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 yeah. like the short answer. Maybe that doesn't come through very clearly because you're not the first person to express uh, express that concern. So like maybe it is me. Like maybe that's something I could have done a little bit better. Uh, but he, uh, I mean, he, he was like basically isolated and like brutalized for at that point, a few months, uh, maybe even a couple of years. I can't remember the timeline off the top of my head. And like, this is the first indication that he has right of anything. Um, and like, if that's true, right, which is the only data that he's got, uh, and he's like really not in a good space, right. Cause like the Drexel Empire is like, man, like I didn't mean for it to be quite as bleak as it is. Like that was not, <laughs> uh yeah. that was not the plan um you know when i was writing like you know when he when he avenges that poor girl early in the book i was like this is going to be really cool he's going to avenge this poor girl but like it was just like really sad the whole thing was just like yeah. really ugly yeah. and, and yeah. unpleasant yeah. uh in my head it was going to be different and i maybe that's like maybe that's what we tell ourselves when we end up in these situations but in my head it was going to be a little bit different it wasn't going to be quite as uh uh just i guess uh dismal right but like how how could it be anything else it's it's set in a gulag right yeah and uh and he's just he's just not well he's just not a well man his his you know he hurts all the time when he can't when he can feel anything you know uh he's by himself he has no friends like lord knows what else he went through right and so like this is the only uh you know like this is the only uh indication he gets of like what might be going on outside um you know, uh, like it, it broke him a little bit. Um, you yeah. know, and he wasn't uh, capable of being very, very clear about it. Um, you know, he, uh, yeah, you know, is uh, uh, sort of a desperate circumstance. And maybe again, maybe it's something that could have been clearer about, but Lorian's not in a good way. Um, yeah. and, and, but uh, it was, it was, it really complicated him because I, like, like it did for Crispin, you know, in, in his novella, it you, you feel like, like, oh, like I did not fully understand. You know his mind or what was going through his his mind and um you know his values and, and the way he views the world like i just didn't fully get it from seeing him from the outside and uh just hearing him uh you know try to have his inner monologue and and remain have a, a calm state of mind i think he's kind of practicing some futuristic form of buddhism that's that's like survived and been outlawed by the the chantry um that's so cool that uh you know he's he's trying to you know, practice this this kind of secret religion um and and then but he's having very very human thoughts like he you know does resent hadrian probably for for being with valka and for taking for for having him take the blame on this prison planet where he might be stuck now forever um so no i thought i thought it was it was really an amazing kind of humanization of, of lorian uh and and then it led to a beautiful moment though when it looks like everything is falling apart for his his escape plan and he might be you know at the end of the road uh it's it's hadrian come along um to to save him and i was like wait is uh is hadrian here is, is this is this just a vision in in lorian's mind is he projecting this um is that was such a cool moment you don't have to discuss what that what that was what it actually um, is yeah, I won't. <laughs> yeah. Uh... <laughs> but that that was really cool it, it felt like the the journey i'd gone on where i was Kind of like a little disappointed in Lorian, uh, kind of, you know, in his in his negative feelings towards Hadrian that he was having. Um, it really led to this beautiful reconciliation um, at the end and this push for Lorian to keep going. Um, so that was that was really a beautiful moment. And then uh, the whole ending sequence really surprised me because I was getting the feeling as this as Lorian had found kind of the the kind of um, uh, I don't remember the name for the group that was living outside of the the, the, the out, kind of prison. Yeah, the out out outborn. Outborn, out, outborn yeah. Um, as he was like leading them in some very successful raids and attacks, and they were putting this big plan together for how they were gonna uh, collapse the the like cord around the elevator and everything. Um, 
And then so quickly that plan went off the rails. Like I did not predict. I thought it was going to be more like the finale of Rogue One. If you've seen that movie, the Star Wars movie, yeah, yeah, where yeah. Uh, like this team, this scrappy team is going to, uh, maybe some people are going to die along the way, um, but they're going to like basically succeed in their plan. Um, and for the, for like everyone besides Lurian to just uh, bite the dust right at the beginning of that sequence. And I'm like, oh my God, like the plan is dead. Uh, that was shocking. Like I, that went way differently than I was expecting it to. Um, and then, you know, then... Lorian's, Lorian's like big foible is that he trusts everybody to be as competent as he is mm. because like he, like he has like every reason to be incompetent, right? Like he's like four feet tall. His like nerves don't work so good actually. Yeah. Like he might, he might break a, a bone like walking. Right. Um, you know, if he, like, he could pass out at any moment, right? Um, and, like, he's still a genius and is able to, like, you know, coordinate these military maneuvers and all of this stuff as long as, like, he doesn't fall asleep, you know, um, or whatever happens. Um, that, like, he can't imagine that anybody else would try less hard than he does. And, like, this is his big, his big issue. And he was fortunate with Hadrian that, like, Hadrian does uh you know they, they like they both are like 110 percent people right and um you know and and with you know all hadrian's people like they were good people right and and so here and so when he when he's like is let down in the books it's because like something else doesn't quite work right you know he's got everything time to the second in ashes of man and mm -hmm. like it's like oh they're like off a little bit that's uh <laughs> very frustrating um you know ruin my big moment you jerks uh and um you know uh so like he doesn't he doesn't have the best people here right it it, it doesn't yeah. work and and um and like this is this is sort of a recurring thing with him he trusts that people will trust as he does right and 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 will give as he is giving and um and and that's partly too that goes back to the the Hadrian thing is like like in his mind I think right the fact that this rumor exists at all like means that like maybe Hadrian isn't doing all that he should be doing right. Like maybe he shouldn't be on Jad at all anymore, right? Like why is he still there? Uh, and I think that's maybe the deeper betrayal is that like even if the like living it up part isn't true, what are you doing exactly? Like what did yeah. I buy you? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And the answer is actually everything, but it's gonna it's gonna take some time. I think two uh, two things about Dregs. One is I like of all of, of the two novellas that I've done that like really have sequels because like Queen of the Ashes is just a hatred mm -hmm. story, right? Like the sequel is Theme and White um you know um i would much rather write another lorian story than i would another crispin one i know people oh yes other, yes please story. Um, um, but there's at least one more story and probably two there could be like a little mini lorian trilogy theoretically between ashes of man and disquiet gods uh, of course disquiet gods is coming out in like two weeks so you're gonna see where that story ends but yeah. i think it, like people who've read disquiet gods already i think it's kind of a surprising place uh mm -hmm. where lorian ends up i think I, I, oh man, I'm so curious. Uh, once Lorian takes that ship out of there, I am so curious uh, what what he's gonna get up to. And so yeah, I would love it. Uh, love to see that sequel. Um, just it was compelling being in his his inner monologue. Like I was saying, the the kind of uh, returning thoughts he was having, you know, the the more kind of Buddhist uh, mantras he was trying to tell himself, and um, and then his deep pain and regret over having to kill a few people like that had never been something he needed to do before and then uh he kept on thinking of it as as murder even if it you know was was gray and uh or or not or in his own defense so like it, it was it was very compelling he did not want to have to kill that last woman in the ship at the end and he was so upset uh when you know she kind of forced him to to do that to so that he could selfishly get away um and i think he he recognized the the uh real ethical uh hazy ground he was he was on there um that yeah, was that it, was so compelling. I was I was I was riveted to the the kind of character journey and, and internal monologue there. I, I loved it, um, and yeah, I, I it, think you're, it's, it's it's a sad journey. I, I hated to do it yeah. to him, but uh, he had he had to get out of there somehow. I needed yeah. him back in space. So. But um, you you're it's been so fun to read the tales and to see all these other POVs. Um, does it feel freeing to kind of get out of Hadrian's POV, or is it is it difficult? Like I I just read the Octavia Octavia Corvo one. That was really fun. Uh, her her last um, stand, and that was that was a really uh, great story. Now, 
every time Kurva's going to show up in the novels since I've even th- just since I've been in her POV for that one short story, I feel like that will enrich my time, you know, with, with her every time she's in a scene. Um, now I understand. Yeah, I, kind of, you know, I love her a lot. I, I think maybe more than uh, most of the supporting cast, she got like the really mm. short end of the stick because she doesn't actually get to do that much in the books. And I, uh, I think she's really cool. Uh, and, uh, you know, she's, Hadrian's like never in the naval combat. So like we, yeah. uh, always doing something on the ground. And so we, they're like never in the same place. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I would have loved to have had her have more screen time, stage time than anybody else, I think. Um, and so go, going to write that story was, was a privilege. I was actually going to mention it. Um, we're talking about, talking about dregs because when I do go to write like another familiar face, right. I always think like, what's the thing that like, we don't know. Right. Like that's mm-hmm. sort of, sort of my first question, you know, is like, well, like Crispin doesn't hate Hadrian. That's what we don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, like Lorian is like actually pretty miserable. Like he's like, he like the, the humor and everything is like, because he is in pain. Right. Um, like that's maybe more obvious, but like, you know, he like, like his life has been pretty hard. Um, you know, and he's tried to smile about it and to be a good person anyway, because that's what you should do. But, um, but like, you know, like, like there are all these little yeah, that, things that... that really, really came through in the, in dregs is just the, the pain of just how people uh, just kind of discriminate against the somewhat, you know, an um, or, or just uh, the words they use around him. Uh, like that just always was just, man, so painful. Every time you'd hear someone calling him a bad name and, and mutant and, and things like that. Um, yeah, just we got a little bit of that feel through the novels, but um, being it with his POV and and you're living it and then uh, you're being being bullied like that constantly, uh, it's it's brutal. Yeah, and, and he can't really do anything about it either, right? Again, he's like four feet tall and like he'll he'll actually die if you hit him too hard. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, we all will, but like hit the point, right? Um, you know, he's he's not Hadrian. He can't like actually fight in these situations. Um, you know, so it's it's a lot more desperate. Um, just being alive, being him. Um, you know, and, and with 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 Corvo, right? It was like that she like actually is not a normal human being at all, mm-hmm. right? Like, you know, she was she was she was sort of built, which Hadrian always suspected, right? But like has never sort of said, you know, on a, like you don't get to be like eight feet tall and you know uh and, and sort of that shredded right naturally so uh <laughs> uh you know so like her whole story is like something that like he doesn't know about because in a certain yeah. extent for Adrian, like it doesn't matter right like he trusts her right um you know i don't like you, you would tell me if you wanted to right and she doesn't so you know, there's a lot of stuff that she never said that's in that story that uh you know uh, is is there i think in the books in like very distanced ways but this is one of those other things that you get with that first person narration whoops dropped my pen uh it's always something it's i took my headphones off i saw him then um but um you know um that's another thing you get with that first person narrator right you get um you get to hide this stuff because that first person narrator doesn't see it and it's it's like that in real life right you like the number of people that we ever really really know is vanishingly small um, and there's something really wonderful about that. Um, something very sad mm-hmm. about that. And it's something that, you know, I, I think we should think more about um, because we have an opportunity to like know more people in our life if we really try. Yeah. And, um, you know, if I can get people to think about that, maybe that's good. Um, on that on that front, I want to mention one of my favorite uh, sequences in Howling Dark, or in the whole series even, um, when... Hadrian and Velka are kind of imprisoned by Karn Segara, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they're they just have a lot of quality time that they get to spend together in that close confines, and you know that that just provided the the time and the space for them to open up and just talk to each other, and it felt like you know Valka's walls. That's what got them to really come down and uh, be a little more open to understanding, you know, Hadrian as as a unique person and not just. Uh, some nobile from from the empire uh, and so that was that was a really beautiful scene i loved i loved that we often in modern fantasy or maybe even older older fantasy and sci-fi don't pause enough in the along these really tense plot arcs for big 
quieter sequences like that. Um, and I loved it. And another one of my favorites from the whole series actually is from Demon in White, where the whole Red Company is just taking a vacation, a little sabbatical on an island out in, <laughs> in Colchis. And, you know, there nothing crazily uh, tense and suspenseful is going on in those sequences, but they're really getting a break. They're, they're, uh, they're able to reflect and, and have some quiet moments and, man, just mixing those in throughout the series. It, it, those were some of those meaningful parts for me. I just wanted to, to spotlight those, some of my absolute favorites um, from, from this series and even in, in all of kind of fantasy and science fiction. Yeah, I I really like the beach episode too. It's it's the it's a you know classic sort of anime trope, right? But it uh, but it's one of those things I kind of wish I had been able to do like another one of. Like I, I feel like I feel like more time like that is good. But these like last books keep getting so long that like find I mean Demon of White is huge, but like uh, finding the space to be able to do something like that has been has been hard again. But this those moments really matter. Um, you know, I uh, a lot of modern readers really criticize Tolkien for the books being so slow at the beginning. We spend so much time in the Shire. Oh, it's so boring. Blah blah blah. Um, fools, all of them, uh, <laughs> right? Uh, because like it's important that we we're there because the Shire won't be when we get home. Uh, and and the point is uh, about that loss, despite the fact that we are victorious, and that loss will not resonate, right? Uh, if uh, if we don't care about the Shire. Uh, and so we have to be there. We have to live there. We have to care about it before it, it is taken from us by Saruman and and, and uh, you know Sharky's boys, right? And and in the same way, way right? Um, when we uh, are looking at you know uh, just the beauty of Middle Earth, right? It was like, oh, he's talking about how green it is again, which he really doesn't actually do that much of. But um, but like oh, he's talking about it again. It's important because like that's what's at stake, right? Is the goodness yeah. of the world is at stake. And having the space to do that in a story where the stakes are about that, right, matters because if it's not there, then nothing's at stake, right? If the reader doesn't care about the people, doesn't care about the places, then they don't care don't yep. about anything, actually. They're just reading to see what's on the next page because it's that or scroll on their phone. Um, and so, like, those, those episodes really really matter um and um I, I i like writing them I, I like my characters to not suffer sometimes um you know uh, there's a lot of suffering uh, in the world and in you know in, in sun eater but um it's not all that um you know and neither in in the books or you know out here yeah and then empire of silence even uh, after that first really crazy gladiatorial melee uh you know they 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 go out for a night on the town and uh, nothing bad actually happens. They some of them get get drunk, and um, you know nothing. There's not some other kind of new contrived drama or tension, and and I do feel like a lot of authors almost feel obligated for like every scene or sequence uh, needs to result in some you know very dramatic kind of conflict or uh, sticky situation, and um, I, I just see that so often. I read I read pretty widely and you know, modern fantasy and sci-fi. And uh, so th these, these types of moments where uh, the characters are just allowed to breathe a little bit uh, and everything is not moving along the, the kind of major plot uh, is, is, is great. I love it. Um, like you said, it builds your investment in the, the places and the characters. And so a lot of times I think in fantasy or, or sci-fi, we care about the stakes just because of the POV characters or like the main group of characters. And if they're going to come out of it, okay. Um, and then we don't really care about the, the settings and the planets and the worlds and the, the countries, but uh, the reads that have touched me the most are the ones where you, you come to care about the stakes for the settings, for the places, not just for those main characters. Uh, I just recently read song for our bone by guy, Gabriel K. I was gonna mention K actually. Yeah, yeah. He, he did that. That was my first K book. He did that unbelievably where I cared so much that the the country of our bone was was going to be able to continue on and not get conquered and their culture destroyed, uh, not just for the main characters that were there, but for the the place and even the the citizenry there for the cultural kind of values that they they had and the the beauty of of that place. Um, Kay did such a great job bringing that to life, and just comparing that to like Dune Messiah, I I wasn't invested. Like I, I heard billions of people supposedly died uh, recently off page like in the galaxy, but Herbert never, you know, got me to care about the stakes for the galaxy on the whole. Like maybe I care about Arrakis um, somewhat, but 
he didn't bring to life the the kind of whole setting and 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 establish the stakes for why I should care if there's this you know galactic jihad. Um, yeah, just yeah. Just, I, I think I, I think Sunny does that really well. Yeah, I I completely agree with you. I was gonna uh, talk about Kay's sailing to Serenity and Lord of Emperors, the the most tragic loss for me uh, in uh, in those books. Like the biggest death is like not a person at all. It's it's a mm. it's a it's an object. Um, uh, and I don't mean the bird for anybody who's seen it. Um, I, I it means something else. I don't want to tell you. Um, uh, but uh, it's it's like very it's very sad, right? Um, and it's like th- those books are also like doubly sad for me, right? Because of course, like you can't go to Constantinople; you can only go to Istanbul, actually. So like the civilization that it's based on does not exist anymore, right? Like you can't actually go see it. So like there's this additional sort of historical sadness there, right? That like oh, I like I couldn't actually like go check out you know the things this is based on you know directly anyway because it's you know it's there's another another culture that's there now. Right, like it's just completely, completely gone. Like you can go to Rome, but like you know, you can't get a flight to Constantinople. It's not there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but uh, man, like the memes on that. Never mind. But um, <laughs> you know. but we can, but we can go there in books, and that's the the beauty of them. And uh, I started in this intro by by mentioning you know how you have been able to transport me and and so many other readers to to these places and to get us to care and have real emotional experiences. And meaningful journeys, and so yeah, I just want to thank you again for for that, and all of your efforts on on our behalf, the readers, and uh, can't wait for book six, Disquiet Gods. It's it's probably the the book, the read that I'm I'm most anticipating in my entire life. Uh, no pressure on. There, oh jeez, okay, um, well. But, but <laughs> oh, no, there's nothing else yeah. I can do about it. The, uh, the die is cast. So, but uh, but people, the, the mega fans seem to love it. Uh, they seem to they seem to say they be responding you know as strongly as they often respond to Demon in White. Um, I've loved I've loved all the books, so I I've just been loving the the entire journey. And I and I I think with the series it's tough too to actually pick out individual books because um, Empire of Silence, you know, it it just can't do a lot of the stuff Demon in White does. It it is situating us in the the places and with the characters. It's, it has to do setup, um, whereas Demon in White can capitalize on all of that setup. Uh, in really cool ways in this middle of the story to be uh, really explosive. Um, but then... Well, it's all one book. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And and Kingdoms of Death and Ashes of Man, like, people say, like, oh, like, you know, I'd like Demon of White more. But uh, they feel like the the right follow-up to Demon of White. Like, it, maybe not as, as much uh, really cool stuff happens in them, but, uh, you know, they feel like a, an important, necessary part of the whole journey. And so I, I don't really love picking out the, the individual books because they're all doing, you know, what, what they're supposed to be doing along the way to build this story. So, um, man, I, I cannot wait for the next installment. Uh, man, when that, when that drops on Audible for Samuel Rackin, I'm going to, I'm going to just, uh, you know, have it pre-ordered. I'm going to throw it on and then uh, my my new hardcover will come and i like reading these immersively actually uh that for me yeah. is is the most immersive reading experience i can get where like visually i'm looking at the the words on the page so i'm not distracted by other things and then i'm i'm getting the the narration at the same time um and so i i will i will try to just be as immersed as as humanly possible in in your story and i can't wait i'm really looking forward to hearing what you think about it we've not long it's uh it's uh april april 2nd audiobooks should be the same day i know historically they've not been right on but uh they are recording it i sent them all of the uh all of the pronunciation uh advice uh, i always have to do like a 30 minute you know mp3 file and send that to <laughs> so, uh, with like a lot of apologies at the end for all of the gibberish uh this one has a lot of uh, alien language in it so uh sorry samuel uh, <laughs> but uh but yeah no so they they should be out on the second just along with everything else and uh yeah no i'm really excited to hear what you think oh thank you so much well i'll uh, i'll let you go we've been on for about two hours now so thanks so much for to having the patience to to just uh come on i know very busy with your your young oh, no daughter now and uh no, it was a delight <laughs> well thanks so much and uh yeah get disquiet gods soon and if you have not started the series uh there's there's no time like the present get into empire of silence and start start the journey all right i'll we'll see you later see ya